Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Capers Business Ventures Connect podcast. We'd love for you to subscribe and looking forward to your reviews of our episodes. If you're interested in becoming a guest on our podcast, we'd love to have you. So please visit us at cbbservices.com forward slash podcast, and we'll be in touch. We're glad you're here, and we're ready to get started. Ever wonder what it takes to be a licensed clinical social worker? Well, you're in luck because our next guest is just that. So let's connect. Hello, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me at the Capers Business Ventures Connect podcast. I'm your host, Mel Capers, and I'm excited and delighted to be here with you. Before we get going, let me give pause and give thanks to my great creator for allowing me just another moment to do his will on this side of heaven. I also want to take this time to shout out some great friends. First, we have Tasha and Kevin White. They are co-founders of Vanguardian Global. They're doing amazing things at Vanguardian Global, and you need to check them out. So please go to their website at VanguardianGlobal.com. I also want to send a shout out to a real good friend. She is Corla Sudwama, founder and chief executive of Agape Love in Action. It is a veterans organization that helps veterans in the local area and around the entire country. She is doing amazing things. She's got a calendar out, too. It's called the Veterans Calendar. You need to check it out, so please go by her website at agapeloveinaction.com. I also want to send a shout-out to a good friend. She is Sonia Pinckney Rhodes, founder and CEO of J.M. Pinckney Publishing Company. She's doing incredible things, and if you're an author wanting to have your book published, please check her out. Go to her website at jmpinckneypublishing.com. And I'm honored to have as a guest today, Shamika Harley Chambers. She is a licensed clinical social worker and she does her work with her heart. I've known her forever. I am so honored to have her here with me today. And guess what? You get to meet her in our first segment we call Meet and Greet. Here we are. Here we are. It is so good to be here and with my guest. She's a very special lady. Now, I have a bunch of special people on my show, but today I reserve this time for this extremely special lady. She is the one and only Shamika Harley Chambers, and she's here with me. I am so excited and delighted to have you here. Shamika, how are you doing? I am well. I hope you are. I am well because you're here and you're smiling and we're going to have a good time. I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, Listen, I know a lot about you and you know I know a lot about you. Now, my audience does not know as much about you as I do. And I don't want to take the time to bore my audience 
because I've been boring my audience now for three seasons. So (laughs) I want to let my guests have an opportunity to talk. So right now is our first segment we call the meet and greet. Now is the time that I want you to let my audience, who is Shamika Harley Chambers? Okay. Well, first I want to say it's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Um, So I am a licensed clinical social worker and I've been in the field since May of 2000. Um, I'm a therapist, primarily working with children, families, um, adolescents, and more recently, more with the adult population, dealing with a variety of mental mental, um, health diagnoses, different life stressors. I deal with trauma um, and just different family dynamics. I am a native of South Carolina. Uh, My practice is in North Carolina. I also um, work in the school district where I work with middle school age children. And so I'm a mother, I'm a wife, um, I'm a daughter, a sister, wear tons of hats, um, definitely a people person, and just enjoy the work that I'm doing right now. You know, the work you're doing is very tough. It's always been tough, but nowadays it's tougher because, um, you know, Mental illness is one of those things that's a big topic right now. But when you talk about children and mental illness, that that really is a world by itself. How did, number one, what made you want to go into that field? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say dating back to high school, I believe it was my sophomore year in high school. I actually thought I was going to go to college and I was going to work at DSS. Department of Social Services, um, just drawn to protecting children um, from adults and abuse and those kinds of things. And then once I got into college, I realized that there was lots that I could do and therapy became the passion early on. I think some of it is just a personality thing I've always said. Um, I was just always the peacemaker. If someone's sad, want to know why they're sad. Um, You identify a need, you want to help meet the need. So it's just I, I really feel like it's a part of just my my uh, my gift and a part of my purpose on, on why I'm here. So just early on, it was always just a love for people, helping people. Um, hate to see anything that's hurt, injured. It could be an animal. Um, and so that's just, it is my gift and it's what I do. But you know, in high school as a sophomore, it just seems like people had their mind going in different direction of what they want to be. And then all of a sudden you want to get in the social services community and that's tough. So when you went to college, was it tough on you emotionally once you were learning what was going to be required of you? I think the college piece of it, um, as they call it, is the skeleton. That's the foundation. And it's not until you start working with people that the quote unquote toughness, the, the tough part come. Um, early on, I legitimately adopted this philosophy that their progress, I don't take ownership for the progress um, that the, the kids are making. I just, I call myself their, um, their sidekick. They're the superhero, I'm the sidekick, just here to help navigate. Um, and so what happens is my faith, there are some situations you really do have to just pray on. And then also, um, competency. And so when I hear what's going on with the families that are going on with the kid, um, there's definitely empathy, but I believe in the model that I'm using and I, and I think strategies and and what tools can I give this person to help them cope and to heal from the inside out, to be able to move forward. Um, feeling sorry for them and losing sleep at night doesn't help <laughs> doesn't help the, the kid progress and move forward so that that's what kind of keeps me grounded and balanced um i won't say that there's never been a time that a situation a, a family or a child was going through um impacted me personally like you you just want to do more for that for that kid um but again it goes back to resiliency and coping um coping strategy teaching So, again, you know, being in high school and then saying, this is what I want to do. You know, I always wondered, people who want to go into that field, you must take some of 
your work home with you because of who you are. How do you separate your work from your personal life? I would, most of the work that I bring home with me is paperwork and the administrative pieces. So you have a session and you've got to do notes or um, I did an assessment and I've got to document that assessment. Um, maybe I decide I'm going to look up some additional strategies to work on with a kid. So from that standpoint, there is work that we, you bring home per se to complete. Um, and in the light of COVID, um, working out of the home setting, work is in the home essentially. But in terms of the emotional component of it, I would just call it a blessing or divine intervention. Um, because I think some of it goes back to that ownership piece that these kids, they come to me and whatever has happened has already happened and I can't undo it. It's about how do I help this kid to move forward? If something were to ever come up, there's supervision, um, colleagues that you kind of talk to and bounce ideas off of. And then it also goes back just to the avenue of prayer. Um, you know, and that and that's just that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's really hard for me to comprehend that because it, I, I would think that if I was there to help a child or whatever, that child would stay with me and I would bring that child home and everything that child's going through would be a part of my mind and I would just, I would just take it all to heart. And I know that you're the type of person who have, you have a gentle heart. So it's, it, it seems to me like you said, it's real easy for you to, to separate the emotional part, which is incredible. But let me ask you this. I mean, with all of the tragedies that we have going on around our country, like recently we had the shootings in the elementary school, how did that impact you and how would it impact you if you had a client who had lost their lives or how do you deal with that? Um, I work in a school setting and I have school aged children, middle school and elementary age child. And so when you hear of things that happen in the school setting, you know, that hits home as a parent and as a person. I'm working in a middle school setting. If something happens in that setting and I don't get to make it home, that directly impacts my family. So those things, it is just this heightened awareness that things are going wrong. Um, all around. And what it is, is that, I, I don't know, I've just kind of like adopted this philosophy, um, even about worry. And so worrying about it doesn't change it. And so I try to take that energy and you move it in a direction where you can make a difference. I can, I love the kids that I work with. Um, I pray for them and their family circumstances. I guess that's what I do, right? And, and I, when I am with them, each client is like the only one I have when I'm with that person. I give them all I have to offer in terms of strategies, listening ear, encouragement, and support. Well, great. Well, you know, I, I tell you, like I said, it would be tough for me because I don't have that makeup where I can just cut it off. And, you know, I work in a business office. I run a business office and I find myself when I come home, I can't shut it down. I. I keep thinking about numbers and bills that we needed to pay and uh, late notices that we, I just can't seem to cut it down. So it's really good that you're able to just kind of keep it separate. But have you been, so you've been in this field since you said 2000? Mm -hmm. Was there, how did you get to North Carolina? How, how did you get from South Carolina to North Carolina? So May of 2000, I graduated um, University of South Carolina in, Orange, um, in Columbia, and I got my first job, Orangeburg Area Mental Health, um, as a result of an internship. And I worked there, I would say close to three years, and then I moved back to Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I'm from. Um, I have younger siblings, and I decided that I wanted to be closer to home to help them. Um, Sometimes sibling needs support and guidance from the big sister, and that's what I did, um, continuing working for the Department of Mental Health. And then at some point along the line, um, probably three years into that, I decided 
I wanted to live in Charlotte. And so that's how I ended up in North Carolina. Never quite made it to Charlotte, but um, <laughs> but I found the job um, here in Statesville that I relocated for. And I worked there shy of 16 years before um, starting to venture out into independent work as a therapist. Did you ever get to the point where you just wanted to throw the towel in and said, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So when I initially moved to North Carolina, I moved here um, because I wanted to do medical social work and I needed to have supervisory experience. So I moved, um, which was a job change. Um, at that time, I wasn't a therapist. I was a program consultant for residential group homes, um, level two and level three group homes. And so therapy had nothing to do with that. Um, it was about supporting the staff that worked directly with kids that were in out of home placement, primarily due to behavioral and emotional behavioral difficulties that those kids were having. Um, and at some point we had this thing when, when the kids would misbehave and they got on their highest level consequence, the consultant had to come in and issue more consequences. And that was the turning point. So I, I went to meet with this kid and he says, they called it a skill focus. And he says, I know you're here to put me on a skill focus. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, what do you want? And I said, that's what I'm here to figure out. What do you want? And then it turned into a almost hour long conversation with him, getting to know the why behind the behavior. Your behavior is telling us a lot and we're missing it. What do you need? And then that's when it clicked back to me, go back to your first love. <laughs> and then I transitioned back into a therapist role. Um, so at one point I really thought that, hey, I'm gonna do medical social work um, in the hospital doing discharge planning, um, not long-term relationships with um, the clients. And a another part of what I think has happened is the more, the longer I've been a therapist, I'm able to learn how to use me and less of me emotionally. So I can sit and have a conversation with a client um, doing trauma-focused CBT, for example, and it doesn't emotionally have to drain me because it's not about me and my emotions, it's about the strategies that I have that can help this client to be able to regulate themselves and cope and be able to um, gain a level of acceptance of what's happened to their life and be able to move forward. Um, and that, I, I would say that that did take some professional maturity, you know, being in the field. Um, you know, people always think we're going to save the world and you get disappointed when you don't. Um, but then I quickly learned, even through graduate school and them telling us, you're not going to save the world. <laughs> you know, you're not going to make a lot of money doing this either. Um, if you can help one person, you've done something. And I think they kind of gave us a re reality check before we even graduated that if you think every person you meet, you're gonna save them from something awful happening, you're, you aren't gonna be any good to anybody or yourself. Um, and then there's a the self care component that I have to love me first, take care of me first, cause I'm the vessel that anything I'm gonna do for my clients flows through. And I can't, you know, I can't be broken and do that and so. I, I, th I thank God for kind of wiring me uniquely that way that I'm able to do what I'm trying to do with these families. Well, I want to get into the point where you're about to start your practice, and we're going to do that in the next segment. So you ready to get to our next segment? Ready for the next segment. Let's do it. So here we are in our segment we call On the Horizon. As you heard, I have the incomparable Shamika Harley Chambers, who's here. She is a mental health therapist doing an amazing job since 
2000. My goodness, many, many years ago, decades ago that we could say now. And she says she's really having a good time being a therapist, helping young children. And that's a great thing. And we're glad you're doing that. We're glad you're here. And what I want to talk about now in this segment, because you talked about uh, starting your own practice. Tell us, where are you with your own practice? And what are the next steps that you have to take to, to take your practice to the next level? Absolutely. Um, at this point, I am still working out credentialing. Um, all, all the insurance companies, as an independent practitioner, I have to get paneled. Um, that's going to help my ability to serve people regardless of their insurance type. So that is a, a critical component for me. That's that's being worked out. Um, I am under contract with a local child advocacy center um, as an independent practitioner and they funnel um, kids that come to their facility so that the child advocacy center does forensic interviews for children based on reports of sexual abuse. And um, once the family comes in through to the child advocacy center and that kid is identified as needing a therapist, then they send those children to me. Um, and that's where I'm able to do some trauma work with those children. So I'm able to hold office hours out of that location. Um, I've also put myself on psychology today. Um, and the, the couple of insurance that I'm already credentialed with, I'm in their provider's handbook. And so then I get referrals from those sources. So I'm working out of the Child Advocacy Center as well as doing virtual therapy online to families across the state of North Carolina. So your practice, you're gonna keep it there in North Carolina? Um, at this moment, that's where I am. Um, there is a plan, what's on the horizon, is looking at South Carolina and potentially, potentially, <laughs> potentially Georgia. That's a mouthful of a word. So once I'm able to do that, um, specifically with the virtual option, um, you have to be licensed in whatever state you want to serve clients in. And so once I get the licensure for South Carolina and maybe Georgia, then I'll be able to market myself to those areas as well. So when you say Georgia, you're talking about uh... South Carolina and Georgia, I'm thinking like in the Charleston, Savannah area, but you're thinking otherwise? It could be really anywhere because it's a virtual platform. So if I have someone that goes on psychology today, they like what they read, feel like, hmm, you know, she, she can help someone like me um, based on her bio and they live in Georgia. We're on the virtual platform, doesn't matter where in Georgia, as long as I'm licensed in that state, um, and I'm con under contract with that insurance company, I'd be able to provide services to that family. What is what is the, the number one thing you fear the most when it comes to doing your own practice? I mean, because most entrepreneurs are very reluctant to take that step. And I always ask them that question, and what is it that frightens you the most? So I'm gonna ask you, what is that one thing that, you know, you have the most fear about that frightens you the most about starting your own practice failing yeah failing and so like i said it's been um 22 years as a therapist working with agencies and for a long time i never had the desire to be in private practice well i'm glad you're taking a, a smart approach for yourself because because you're going to have to be comfortable and some days it's it's not going to be as uh, comfortable as you'd like, but uh, do you have a mentor? So I have um, two clinicians that I talk to frequently, um, and one in particular will answer anything <laughs> that I have ever asked her. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I supervised her as a student intern. Um, she's doing therapy, you know, coming to be a therapist as a career change she's actually like in the business um the business arena is her thing so i knew early on she'd be a private she, she'd quickly get into private practice um and she and she takes that approach with me she said when i came to you you taught me everything you knew and now i'm going to teach you everything i know 
So it's a beautiful thing. I can ask her anything, share a document. How do you handle this process? Um, and she seems to be quite transparent with me and she's been a blessing this, during this process. Hey, listen, we've exhausted this particular segment and now it's time to get to our next segment. So are you ready to get to our final segment? Let's get to it. Let's get to it. final segment we call this the connect segment this is the segment where i ask my guests how do people get in touch with you what i, I just need to know your your email your bank account your credit card I, okay i need to know the email social media website whatever you want to share with people how do folks get in touch with you okay so i can be found on psychology today shamika harley chambers um, I can also be reached via email at Shamika, S-H-A-M-E-K-A dot be the change at gmail.com or by telephone, 843-412-2182. That's how you get in touch with Shamika, but I still am waiting for the credit card, the bank account <laughs> number. Don't worry, I'll put the money back. <laughs> It's, it's been an absolute treat to have you on the Connect Podcast. And whatever we can do for you to help you connect to the world, we're going to do it for you. But I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to stop by and visiting with us. It really has been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. And thanks again for having me. I truly appreciate it. Absolutely. There you have it. Ms. Shamika Harley Chambers right here with me, Mel C., we will see you the next time. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, Capers Business Ventures Connect. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. So please like, share, subscribe, and leave a review. You can also find us on social media. We're on Facebook and LinkedIn at Capers Business Ventures. And on Instagram and Twitter, you can find us at CBV Services. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.